Thanks so much for inviting me, Katerina and Ratna and everyone at Maitri. It's an honor to be part of this amazing series. Um, and let me just take a moment to say how great the Five Good Ideas series is. I always find it ironic that while we often stereotype the private sector as being fiercely competitive, perhaps backstabbing, and the nonprofit sector of being very collaborative and working together, sometimes I, I feel like it's quite the opposite. That the private sector has national think tanks, collaborative advocacy at all levels, trade shows and price fixing, lots of examples of working closely together. Whereas in the nonprofit sector, sometimes we're too busy working on our own things and sometimes competing over the same grants and not working together. And I just want to congratulate and thank Maytree for organizing events like this where everyone comes together and share ideas. So quick round of applause for Maytree. I also want to thank whoever named this series for calling it Five Good Ideas, because it's actually not a very strong adjective. And if it had been called Five Extraordinary Ideas or Five Terrific Ideas, I'd be very nervous today about meeting your expectations. But if all you need is five good ideas, I can probably pull that off. So let's give it a shot. The topic today is Five Good Ideas about campaigning for social change, which is something I've been trying to do for 10 or 15 years with varying degrees of success, and I'll try and share some of the things I've learned along the way. The first good idea is to reach beyond the usual suspects. And I use that word um, even though it's often used in a negative way against us, almost in a derogatory way. When we had the large turnout at the budget consultations half a year ago, some of the uh, counselors at City Hall said, oh, we don't need to listen to these folks. They're just the usual suspects. And that wasn't true. I spoke to a lot of people there who had never been to City Hall before. They weren't bussed down by the unions. They weren't paid by the unions. They were people who cared about the city. And I defended those people and wrote a blog post against that idea of the usual suspects. At the same time, I think we should acknowledge that there are kind of usual suspects. There is a small group of people in Toronto who are hyper-engaged. Many of us are, you're probably all part of that group if you're here. And anytime there's an event at OISE or, 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 or U of T or anywhere where there's a, it's an activist theme, we recognize a lot of faces. We know who the first three or four people will be at the mic for the Q&A. And if we want to have successful movements, how do we get beyond those numbers? I was uh, talking on the CBC a week after that meeting about the usual suspects thing and about civic engagement and about an exhibit I have up called The Fourth Wall about making City Hall more accessible. And the person who was interviewing me said, Dave, do we really need to be talking about how to make City Hall more accessible? We've seen amazing growth in participation. Just two weeks ago, we had 300 people at City Hall deputing on the budget. This is amazing. And I said, really? Have we set the bar that low? 300 people in a city of 2.5 million is a, is a sign of high engagement when 20 or 30,000 will fill a stadium for a pop concert? I mean, 300 people fill bingo halls every night. It's really not that exciting, folks. We need to be aiming much higher. So we need to really reframe uh, what we consider to be successful in terms of numbers. And it really means reaching beyond the people who we usually attract. Um, how do we do that? So here's a few quick I ideas. One is to be really fun with marketing. Um, people get a lot of messages every day thrown at us through advertising, billboards, ads on TV. And if you want to break through the clutter, I think we need to use the same tactics that a lot of those advertisers use, which means using color, images, fun ideas, etc. And I'll give you a few uh, examples of projects I've worked on. This is the City Idol project, which is now a documentary film. It was essentially a series of speech nights where people showed up and gave speeches about how they would make City Hall better. It's like American Idol, where you're competing with ideas instead of songs. If we had called this speech night, no one would have signed up to run, no one would have signed up to watch, and no one would have made a documentary about it. Just by the branding and using the logo, we had 70 candidates on stage, 600 people in, in the audience, because we spent as much time thinking about the branding and marketing as we did on the project itself. Another one is the Ranked Ballot Initiative of Toronto. This is a campaign for voting reform. We found out how to use an acronym that spells rabbit, Ranked Ballot Initiative of Toronto, which allows us to have beer coasters and buttons with little rabbits on them. And I don't think many people would wear a button for a voting reform if it didn't look as cute as this little bunny. <laughs> cell phone companies use bunnies to sell their cell phones, so why shouldn't we use bunnies to sell voting reform? And if I made buttons that just said, voting reform now, with a fist in the air, I know 20 people who would wear them. 
that's not enough for social change, right? If we want to break beyond that, we need to have cute bunnies. Here's a third one. Uh, this is called Windfest. It's an annual kite festival I organize. Why does a political geek organize a kite festival, you might ask? Because it's a great way to promote wind energy. And if you organize a rally to support green wind energy, who will show up? People who already like wind energy. But if you organize a kite festival that's all about wind, and then people who show up are exposed to bullfrog power and, other, uh, and the Toronto Re Renewable Energy Co-op and other stuff, and there's information booths about green energy, then you're kind of taking a Trojan horse approach where you're sneaking them in with something. I mean, everyone likes kites. And then you link it back to uh, wind energy. Um, but again, if I had a rally about wind energy, the usual suspects would show up. Uh, we'd have a lot of fun, but we'd be achieving nothing in terms of getting beyond the usual suspects. Um, so that's uh, fun marketing, breaking through the clutter. Second is jargon. We often have an insider language. And the thing about insider language is you don't know it's insider language because you're talking to other people who use the same language. Every sector, um, every fad, every hobby has insider language. And that's okay, except for our work. If you're really into baseball, and you're talking with other people who are into baseball, and you talk about RBIs and ERAs, and things like change up, chatter, chopper, chase, and cheese, which are all baseball terms, that's okay. Someone walking by won't know what you're talking about. Who cares? You don't need them to like baseball. But if we want people to like what we're doing, our work is all about reaching out. We're not just trying to talk to each other about our insider language. We're trying to uh, convince others. We can't use insider language. I was on Josh Madlow's radio show two weeks ago, and I used the term PWIC live on radio. I was like, hey, Shelly, remember that PWIC meeting? And then Josh interrupted and said, that stands for Public Works and Infrastructure. Of course. It was so silly of me to use the word PWIC. We can't use that kind of insider language. Exec, it's not an exec meeting, it's an executive committee meeting. How many people here have said the word E-Day? Or E-Day minus seven? It's not E-Day minus seven, it's a week before the election. Um, or struggle, the struggle against neoliberalism. Most people don't talk that way, folks. <laughs> so why don't you just say, working together to create a more humane society? which anyone will understand and they'll probably like it and say, oh, I'm going to do that. People, I mean, a lot of us spend our whole days and nights thinking about politics. Most people have very busy lives and we want them to fit it into that one or two hours of extra time. And no one's going to say, hey, honey, I'll be back in two hours. I'm just going to go join the struggle <laughs> against neoliberalism. <laughs> and here's another example, which some people might not like, but the term brother and sister. Every time I'm in a room full of union folks, and at the podium they say, welcome brothers and sisters. All I'm thinking of is that person who's there for the first time, trying to check out, okay, I'm gonna find, I've been unionized for 20 years, I've never gone to a meeting, what are these union folk all about? And they walk in and they're like, oh, it's kind of like a cult. Weird. <laughs> People don't talk that way, brother and sister, unless you're a brother and sister or a very close <laughs> friend. So I think, I think we need to think about that person in the room who isn't part of the scene and we want them to come back and stay. The fourth, the fourth is media. Media interviews are good for a whole bunch of reasons to get any exposure in the media, but the main thing that's good about it is that you're reaching people you'll never reach any other way. People who don't come to your meetings, don't come to your events. And the tougher the interview, the better of an opportunity is. So I was at Havergal two months ago doing a, a whole bunch of workshops on, on social change, and we were doing media training. And we were doing, we were doing like the easy interview and the hard interview. So the easy interview for like bike lanes would be, Here's uh, Sarah Smith. She has a great project to bring new bike lanes to Toronto to make the city greener and safer. Tell us about your project, Sarah. And the hard interview is, Sarah Smith is part of a small group of people who want to slow down traffic by taking away car lanes and put in an infrastructure that we can't afford and that no one's going to use in the winter. Sarah, tell us about your project. <laughs> and you need to practice both of those, but it's the second interview where you're really going to make a difference. Because chances are that first easy interview it's not just the interviewer who likes what you're doing. Chances are the people listening are already supporters. You want to get, um, in, you want to do interviews with people who don't agree with you, so their listeners might be persuaded to move over. Okay. And of course, I always do this. I've got like three hours of content here to fit into 20 minutes. I might start talking faster. Okay. Number two is empower your membership. We sometimes view our supporters primarily as a financial resource because we want their membership dues and it is the most sustainable type of funding, not from a foundation but from your own constituency. And having funding allows you to hire staff and pay rent 
and often we see it as advocating on their behalf. I've even seen this from groups that I've founded, like the Toronto Cyclist Union. They have on their website, join the bike union so we can advocate on your behalf. I think that's the wrong approach. It's much more powerful to get them to advocate on their own behalf, to give them the tools they need by giving them more information um, so they know the counter arguments, the counter counter arguments, um, but also the ability to know who to phone and when and how. And the advantage of this is that there's way more of them than us. So your policy advocacy director, you have one. If you have 2,000 members, don't you want them all advocating? The thing is we don't want to just mass mobilize them. We want to micro mobilize them, which means they're advocating to their local councillor or their local MP or their local MPP in their riding or ward. If you get 500 people out to a rally, great. I mean, that's nice. There's lots of good reasons to do that. That's not necessarily going to sway any politician. But if you get 50 people to actually phone the politicians, and if you're targeting the wards or ridings where you know you need to switch votes, that's very valuable. But that means that you have a database that can sort your membership by ward. So you can send a targeted message that doesn't just say, they're threatening to close libraries. Phone the mayor and tell them not to close libraries. It should, your message should say, the library in your neighborhood, three blocks away from your house, is under threat. Phone your counselor. This is her name. This is her phone number. This is her executive assistant. This is his name. Phone them today. That's a much more effective way than getting even 2,000 people out to a rally. It's the micro-mobilizing using targeted um, ward-specific messages. Um, another quick thing here is to fight celebrification of the nonprofit sector. Um, so the media, and even ourselves sometimes, we want to figure out who the heroes are. We put people on pedestals. And we have to fight that because it disempowers everyone else who's involved. And I find that when the media contacts me to talk about a project I'm working on, they want the story to be about me. They try and do a photo of me and write about me. And I push back a lot. I can't change the story sometimes, but I can change the photo. I'll refuse to do solo photos sometimes. And I'll say, no, if you want a photo, you've got to take a photo of my team. And the reason that's important is because it gives credit to the people who are doing a lot of the work. But more importantly, if someone looks in the newspaper and sees a photo of a group of people who are doing amazing work, they might imagine themselves in the photo. How do I join this group? I can easily see my face in this group. But if they see a photo of me, well, how do they fit in? They might think, oh, great, I'm glad Dave's doing that great work. Good for him. And they'll go to the next page. So always try and get group photos and counter. Uh, it's partially laziness, and there's other factors, but the media is always trying to make it about the one hero. You've got to fight back against that. Um, and one more quick thing here. Uh, if you're fighting really big issues and have big goals, like reducing poverty or saving the environment, make sure you also break it down into very small, winnable goals. That empowers your membership, because people want to know and feel that their energy is actually contributing to something tangible. And it's very hard to measure if you're ever winning against those big goals. So small, winnable, and relevant goals are really important. So that was empowering your membership. Number three. Give the media what they want. The media is such a powerful tool for us. Um, imagine how much it costs to pay for an ad on the front page of a newspaper. I mean, none of us will ever be able to afford that. But if you can get uh, a journalist to like what you're doing and they put your story in the front page of the paper, you've just reached you know, tens or hundreds of thousands of people for free. So media is worth so much money to us and so much exposure and relates back to that first topic of getting beyond the usual suspects. So how do you do that? A few quick tips. One is to realize that it's a symbiotic relationship. We often go into media outreach thinking, how do I get them to cover me? Um, as if they're offering us um, something, and they're doing us a huge favor by covering our work. It's important to realize that it's symbiotic, and we have as much to give them as they do to us. So without the media, our campaigns won't go very far. But without anything to write about, newspapers don't go very far. They need you. And they're thinking about how much they need you just as much as we think about how much we need them. But also, they want you, right? A lot of people go into journalism because they really care about the issues. No one goes into journalism to get rich. These are people who care about the same issues you do. And in fact, they might even care about it more than you do. They might be sitting around really wanting to write an article about an issue, but they can't do it until they have someone to write about, because that's journalism. You're not supposed to just make up your own stories unless you're a columnist. So you're actually helping them to be a collaborative activist. Some of them uh, are literally waiting for you to send out the press release so they can write the story that they've been dying to write anyways. 
So it's not about convincing them to write the story. It's about helping them, providing them the tools they need. See them as colleagues, as collaborators. And a few more quick tips here. If you have a very small grassroots group, spend a bit of time to make your group seem bigger than it is. Because a journalist isn't supposed to write about groups that don't really exist. But lots of, I mean, I, I ran the Toronto Public Space Committee, which wasn't a real group. We had no money, no staff, no office. I just made up the name and made a website, which is 20 bucks a year for hosting. But because I had a nice business card and a few flyers that looked professional, they felt comfortable saying, Dave Meslin, coordinator of the Toronto Public Space Committee. <laughs> if you aren't part of some group, they can't quote you. Um, these days, they quote people who tweet for some reason, which is really weird. But other than that, they can't quote you just because you say something interesting. Make up a fake group if you don't have one. Or if you have a small grassroots group, make something slick so it looks like there's an office of staff behind you. Um, be fearless and gutsy. I was doing some work last year about the uh, John Street environmental as assessment. There were a few different proposals of how to recreate John Street. And the one that they wanted to do didn't have bike lanes. And I felt there was room for bike lanes. So I looked at their staff report, and it, it, it looked at the modal breakdown of who's using John Street. And it said only 2% of the traffic was cyclists. I didn't believe it. I thought their numbers were wrong. In fact, I, didn't, I was absolutely sure they hadn't gone out and counted at all. I could have sent out a press release saying, I challenge the city's numbers. I could have done a blog post. Instead, I organized volunteers through Facebook. Who wants to come out and do a traffic count? And I bought traffic counters. I announced that we were doing it publicly. And the media came and took photos and wrote articles about these young you know, activists who on their own were volunteering to do traffic counts because the city wasn't doing the job well. And we found out that 32% traffic at certain times of the day was cycling. Um, if you're creative with press events, like I said before, they're dying to cover your work. You have to give them something interesting. A press release on its own won't do it. A press conference that looks like this won't do it. Like this isn't a photo anyone's going to put in the, in the paper. They need something visual. I'll give you two quick examples. The Toronto Environmental Alliance asked me three years ago, uh, Mez, how can we get the number 1,700 in the newspaper? That's how many people die from smog-related illnesses every year. 1,700. We want to get the word out. How do we do it? What we ended up coming up with was the idea of a smog hike, where we would make posters of silhouettes with a little blank kind of thought bubble. And people would write in personal messages about how they've been affected by smog or smog illness in their life or people they love. And th that went out through schools. And we collected 1,700 personal messages. We installed them at the foot of Young Street as an art e exhibit hanging from strings. It was beautiful, like a, kind of like a laundry line. And we got a lot of print media out of that. Uh, and they hung there for hours. Then we went on a smog hike where we put one poster on each utility pole, each pole representing one death. And we marched north on a smog hike until we ran out of 1,700 posters, which took us into Vaughan or Markham, whatever it is up there, Young. Um, it took us two or three days. The media loved it. We had the front page of one of the transit dailies. Uh, we had two or three articles in the Star. And the number 1,700 was really out there. But if we had just done a press conference or a rally or a protest, I don't think we would have had any coverage, because it wasn't even news. I mean, that's the same number it was three years ago. This isn't new data. But we were able to do something creative to put it back uh, in the news. When we launched the Toronto Cyclist Union, we wanted to get lots of members. The idea was to have a funded, membership-based organization with paid staff. So we launched it two and a half years ago, and no one knew who we were. We had zero brand recognition because we didn't exist yet. And what I did for the launch was I organized a big event called P the Pee Wee Picture Play. The Pee Wee, oh, it was a play on the... Rocky Horror Picture Show, I guess the Pee Wee Herman Picture Show. It was a live shadow cast of, of uh, Pee Wee's Big Adventure. It's a movie about how someone steals his bike and he has to, to find his bike. And the people we got to act in this, in this thing were like um, indie, indie pop stars from the uh, Brooklyn social scene and, and other bands. And we did it at the Bloor Cinema. We sold out two shows. That's about 1,500 people. And we had the front cover of iWeekly because we were combining cycling, environment, and music. We were giving them, like I said, giving the media exactly what they want. They all, they, people at I like bikes, but they can't put it on the cover unless someone gives them a reason to. And we gave them the reason to, and we got the, the cover story. So here's a brand new nonprofit, no members. It's their first week on the front cover of iMagazine. And now we have over 1,000 paid members and an office and two staff. OK, number four. 
embrace deep democracy. I'm not going to spend too much time on this. Uh, we can talk about it a bit more later. The idea is very simple. Uh, and you can, there's lots of information about this idea on the internet. My understanding of it is that instead of seeing democracy as a team sport where there's a good side and a bad side, a right side and a wrong side, and your goal is to beat the other team, as we do in soccer and baseball, that democracy is rather people coming to the table with different opinions that all have some validity because they come from deep people's different lived experiences. And democracy is about people trying to understand the opposing views and ideally come together in some kind of consensus or at least compromise. And I find that sadly our political discourse at all three levels comes down to two sides. Is it transit city versus transportation city? Is it this versus that, this versus that? And no one's actually trying to understand why the other side might be supporting the, the other plan. And very often there's a lot to learn from opposing views. And the reason this is important is because I actually think most people are moderate. It goes back to the first thing about reaching beyond the usual suspects. If we take a hardline view, for transit city or transportation city, you're going to be alienating a large group of people who might be supporting one or the other plan for very good reasons. So I think we gain more in the long run by actually listening to opposing views, trying to understand what it is that they like about the other view and maybe try to incorporate that back into your view and find a way to get everyone on board. Okay, and the last one here, Radna mentioned that I'm a geek. He said I'm kind of a geek. I was almost offended by that. I'm a full-on geek, everyone. There's no, there's no kind of about it. <laughs> so one of the things I'm really geeky about is voting reform and democratic renewal. We're very focused usually on who is running for office, who is in office, and what their policies are. And I think sometimes we need to take a step back and look at how the system works. And we have a great opportunity now because we're probably not going to have any elections for about three years, maybe less maybe more. But we've got a period of time now where we had three elections within a 12-month period and we're going to have a break now. Let's look at how the system actually works. And I'll give you a few quick examples of why this is important. If we have democratic systems that don't give us the results we vote for, it makes the rest of our advocacy almost meaningless. So people campaign throughout the whole last federal election trying to convince people to be left of center, right of center, in the center. And in the end, most Canadians rejected the Conservatives. The advocacy worked. Everyone who tried to convince people to vote left or center left won. They won the election. It's amazing, except that Harper has a majority, including 10 seats in Toronto. Half of the seats in Toronto went to the Harper Conservatives, even though most people in every single one of those ridings voted for the other parties. In fact, the, Harpers, the Harper Conservatives won most of those seats because the NDP vote went really high. Toronto shifted way to the left in those Scarborough and Etobicoke, North York ridings, and they ate into the liberal vote. The biggest percent shift in those ridings wasn't the Tories going up, it was the NDP going up. So why don't we fix that system? I'm going to give you two quick things, two quick ideas here. Um, the first is called proportional representation. And PR is used in most democracies all across the world. All these new democracies emerging from the Arab Spring, none of them are looking at Canada as an example of how to run their democracy. In fact, when they came up with their short list of which options to look at, I doubt it was even on that. I mean, it's not even a democratic system, really. It's a, it's a joke. It doesn't work. Our elections are almost random. So proportional representation would ensure that every party gets the proportion of seats that they got with their vote. And the reason this is really important is that the role of small parties isn't necessarily to form power. In the private sector, small businesses play a huge role in shifting um, the marketplace by stealing a bit of the market share. So if a small store 15 years ago, like, like Earthroot, starts selling a lot of recycled paper, then the big companies like Staples have to say, okay, we're losing a bit of market share, people want recycled paper, let's get recycled paper. Those small stores impact the whole marketplace. Uh, Earthroots will never, sorry, Grassroots will never become a massive supplier. But stores like that affect it because the market share. So if they steal 1% of the market share, it's a lot of money. Green, uh, the Green Party has stolen 5 to 10% of the market share. People are voting green. The thing is, it's not translating into dollars. So that market signal isn't being sent. The other parties can essentially ignore the Green Party because even though people are buying that paper, it's not actually taking money off of the, um, off of the revenue. Do you understand the metaphor? It's kind of sloppy. But, um, our system, the free market, I think, works very well 
in allowing small businesses to shift the marketplace. And we need that to happen in our democracy as well. And the other thing I want to mention quickly uh, is instant runoff voting using ranked ballots. It's not a proportional system, but it's for local politics at the city level. And I think you would transform our democracy in tons of ways. Um, we all know what's happening right now at City Hall. There's good reasons for us to look at fixing our system. It would do a few things. So just give me one minute to wrap this up. Number one, we hear a lot about how city councillors are in for life. But once you're elected, you're a councillor for life because of name recognition. It's not true. Absolutely not true. Half of city council won their seats with less than 50%. Half of those are incumbents. So we're talking 25% of city council were in office before, and most of their constituents said, we don't want you back. It's 10 city councilors. So it's a complete myth that these folks are winning on name recognition. They all got their seats back, those 10, because the opposition vote was split. So if I'm a city council with only 30% support, 70% hate my guts, I'm in big trouble if you run against me. You'll get 70. But if you run against me and you do and you do and you do and you do and you do, well, I'm okay. You guys just split the 70. You all got 10, 15, 21, and I win with 30. Runoff voting makes sure that people actually have a majority, which means more turnover. And we can never increase diversity on city council unless we increase turnover, because most of them are white men. We know that. The other thing that it does is it makes for campaigning more positive. In a runoff race, uh, if I'm running against this table, under the current system, I would benefit by just trashing them, digging up dirt, saying bad things. We don't want, we don't want women. Whatever I could find that somehow separates me from you and negatively criticizes you, because I want people to not like you and like me. And that's why I have so much negative campaigning. In a runoff race, that's a really bad strategy. I'll win in a runoff by making sure that your supporters like me. So if you drop off first, your supporters will come to me. I can't trash you. So we would raise, raise the level of debate, the positivity. It would ensure that we have more turnover, which is more diversity. And one more last thing, it also ensures that more people can run. Because again, under the current system, because of vote splitting, if me and Radna are running against each other, and the real issue of the day is, you know, long hair versus kind of short hair. If someone else wants to come into the race who has short hair, let's say you want to run, the short hair people are going to say, you shouldn't run. You're going to split the vote. This is a big mistake. Don't run. And I've seen this happen in every ward. It's usually young people. It's usually women. It's often women of color. And they're stepping aside from someone who has better connections than they do, who's related to a politician, who has worked to a politician. And that's what's keeping diversity out of city council. People are being told not even to run. And we can never measure that through data and statistics because we don't know. They're not even on the ballot. So I'm a little over time. I'm just going to wrap up by saying, by summarizing the five, be creative to recruit new energy beyond those who are already engaged. Give your membership the tools they need to be advocates themselves. Transform your view of the media into a symbiotic collaboration. Embrace other opinions and be willing to change your own and always be advocating for democratic reforms so more people can be heard and so we can quicken the pace of social change. Thank you.